once we have our pistons out, we're going to have to do an inspection. A couple of things to note about the Toyota pistons that we're, we're looking at here. Um, these are a cast hyper-eutectic piston. Uh, cast, of course, referring to the manufacturing process. If we look underneath, you can actually visually identify these as cast by the casting marks. So these lines and the sort of waffle pattern that you're seeing underneath are from the, the mold that they were cast in. The alternative to casting, of course, is forging. And if we have a look at a forged piston on the bottom side, there's no evidence of any casting marks there, no lines or anything of that nature. This piston was basically pounded into shape and you can see how smooth it is, and the tooling marks there definitely indicate that manufacturing process. Um, Hyper-eutectic, of course, means that this piston has got a high silicon content. Um, really good for thermal expansion, or thermal properties, I should say, and also good for strength. And you can tell the silicon content based on the color of the alloy. Um, if I show you a traditional cast aluminum piston, you can see they don't have quite the same luster to them. Getting on to the inspection, first thing we're going to do is we're going to look for carbon when we take these out of the engine. Um, any carbon that's there is going to have to be cleaned off. It's important to note that carbon on the top of the piston and uh, around the top ring is totally normal. Um, we will have to remove it, of course, before we put it back into service. And even for a proper inspection, if this thing is totally covered in carbon, we're not going to be able to see anything, and we don't want it to hide anything. A uh, proper way to clean this, or the best way to clean it, is with a solvent. A solvent is not going to damage the piston. Uh, we don't have to worry about sanding or scraping or doing anything like that when we're able to use the solvent. So that's definitely the way that we want to go. I'm looking at the wrist pin right now, and the design of this piston, this is what we call a full floating wrist pin. So with a full floating wrist pin, you can tell right away because of the snap ring that's holding it in. There's one on either side of the piston. Nice thing about these ones is they're yellow, so they're easy to identify. So that's another thing I want to look at. I want to make sure that both of those snap rings are in place and condition looks good. I don't want to see any cracking or anything um, in the snap ring groove or around that pin boss, right? And we should be able to move back and forth. This guy is going to be, um, the connecting rod itself will have a brass bushing in the center that allows that to float. And the pin is only secured into the piston itself by those snap rings. If I remove those snap rings, it should be fairly easily, easy for me uh, to remove that wrist pin. The alternative to this, of course, would be a semi-floating uh, where we would have the wrist pin having an interference fit in the connecting rod without the bushing. And if I can slide this back and forth, there's obviously not an interference fit. So double identifier there, snap ring and the piston, and the fact that I can move the connecting rod back and forth. Moving along with our inspection, uh, first thing I want to look for now, as far as condition of the piston itself is cracks, I want to pay attention to anywhere around the skirt area. And the skirt of the piston, of course, would be identified in, in this case. This is a slipper skirt piston there and on the other side. So this is a symmetrical slipper skirt piston. Um, if the skirt continued all the way around, it would be what we call a full round piston. And in this case, this is a symmetrical uh, because the slipper skirt on either side appears, at least without measuring, but uh, to the eye, to be the same side. And asymmetrical means that one side would be smaller than the other. Typically, the larger side would be the major thrust side, um, where we would want to spread the contact area out a little bit. So I'm looking for, for cracks first and foremost, and I don't see any on the skirt, which is good. Second place I want to look for cracks is around the pin boss. There's a lot of loading that happens and a lot of abuse that is taken around the wrist pin there. So I want to look around the diameter there. Underneath, I want to make sure that I'm not seeing any cracking in around here, and then again on the other side, no cracking there. And again, that all looks pretty good to me. I also want to have a look at the ring lands. So in between the piston rings themselves, and make sure that I don't have any cracking there that could be caused by improper end gap or, or anything of that nature. Right? And again, we look pretty good. Next thing I want to do is go back to my skirt and I want to look for scoring. Now, a little bit of light vertical scuffing 
is totally normal. We think of way, the way that this piston is going to move inside the engine, it's got that up and down reciprocal nature. So contact between the, the slipper skirt and the wall is going to happen. So light vertical scuffing is totally normal. What I don't want to see is a large amount of deep gouging or scoring. I don't want to see anything that's moving on a diagonal path or in a zigzag pattern that would indicate a bent rod. Um, and I don't want to see metal removed. This particular piston um, has an anti-friction coating on the skirt to, to uh, cut down on contact and wear, or well, not contact, but, but wear. And I wanna make sure that that coating is not compromised, that should be there. So if this were an engine that had, say, a cooling system malfunction or an overheating problem and thermal expansion was allowed to run unchecked, what we would actually end up happening is we'd have more expansion than we want with the piston, more expansion than we want with the block, and there would be physical contact between the two. Uh, the same thing could happen with lack of lubrication where we have metal on metal contact and basically it starts to tear up the, the sides of the cylinder wall and it starts to tear up the piston. So if we saw anything like that, we definitely would want to make sure um, that we knew exactly what was going on and we wouldn't be able to reuse the pistons. We'd probably at that point be machining or um, boring the block and refitting new pistons. And of course we'd have to identify the failure and correct it before we put it back into service. Last thing I want to check at this point is the skirt diameter. And we're going to measure the skirt diameter at 90 degrees to the wrist pin. Uh, not in line with the wrist pin. Obviously we don't have a skirt in line with the wrist pin so that becomes a non-issue. But the reason we're doing that is because being cam ground, this piston is not round as it sits on the bench. So we know that the bulk of the thermal expansion that's going to happen is going to happen in line with the wrist pin. So 90 degrees to the wrist pin is going to be a larger diameter until it heats up. Of course, we can't get this thing to operate in temperature sitting on a bench. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the skirt across 90 degrees from the wrist pin. To do that, I'm going to use an outside micrometer, which I've already calibrated. And my Toyota information says to measure this about nine millimeters from the bottom of the skirt. So I'm going to close my mic. Actually, this might be better if I tipped it up this way. And my spec for this from Toyota, uh, I have a maximum standard spec of uh, 3 inches and 700 thou and a minimum spec of 3 inches, 694 thou and 110 thou. This one is sitting at 3 inches, 699 thou and 110 thou. So we are perfectly within spec. 